We're going to be reading Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the arms from his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Over the past few weeks, we've seen that understanding that every person is created in God's image is crucial to our understanding of illness and disability and healing. It's the foundation for care for one another and it's a dignified approach to our human frailties. We saw in Genesis 1 how the image of God is not something that humanity has, it's something that humanity is. All human beings are in the image of God because that is how God has created us. No precondition is attached to that. To be human is to be made in God's image because God has bestowed it upon us. He's declared it. It's intrinsic to who we are. To be human is to bear God's image, and there are no exceptions to that. But as we've also seen, for many people living with chronic illness and or disability, bearing the image of God is what often comes under attack. Words designed to inflict shame are shouted or whispered quietly at us. You do not belong. You are not wanted. You are not loved. There have been all attempts to dehumanise us and to deny the image of God in us. I believe we see that most clearly in today's passage. The man today is under attack from demons and from his community, almost to the point where his identity is overwhelmed. You might have noticed as we went through the passage there, the confusion in the man between I and we. In verse 9 he says, My name is Legion, for we are many. And in verse 10, and he begged Jesus not to send them out of the area. The influence of the demons is so great, his identity is in danger of becoming lost. His personality is almost overpowered by the legion of demons inside. So he runs to Jesus, he sees Jesus in verse 6. He runs to him and falls at his feet. 
but by the very next verse, the demons are speaking through him. And if that's not enough for the man to endure, in verse 4 we see his community's treatment of him. He had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. That word subdue literally means tame. It's a word that was used to tame wild animals. To them he'd become an animal that had to be caught and chained up and, uh, and controlled. They had lost sight of his humanity. The demons had such a control of him that they thought he's now somehow less than human, an animal to be tamed. Eventually they couldn't tame him and so he escaped to live among the tombs, crying out in his torment, cutting himself with stones. It's a terrible, pitiful sight. And the end result is this man seems close to being lost, lost to his family and friends, lost almost to himself. Like the demons, sorry, like the disciples on the way over, fearful of drowning in the lake, the man's personality is drowning under the oppressive weight of the demons. And yet, we see Jesus travel all the way across the lake to find him and free him and restore him. With a word, he calmed a storm on the way over. Here, with a word, he'll bring peace to this deeply troubled man. One of the beautiful things in this passage is in verse 9 where Jesus asks him, what is your name? And some people think that Jesus wants to know the name of the demon so he can cast it out. But that's, Jesus has never been interested in demons' names. He just wants them got rid of. No, he wants to know the name of the man. He wants to make contact through those clamoring voices. Where the locals only saw an animal, Jesus saw a human being made in God's image, precious to him. And so with all the, uh, the power and authority of the Son of God, he demands that those evil spirits leave. And in verse 15, the people of the region see this beautiful scene. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. It's those last words in that verse, in his right mind, express what I've been struggling with in preparing this sermon. I'm glad I had two weeks uh, with Steve Lilly last week to try and wrestle with this, and I'm still not particularly confident, but I want to make a clear point in this. Because I think this passage helps us begin to understand the experience of people living with mental illness. But I want to stop right there and make it as clear as I possibly can that demon possession and mental illness are completely different things. Completely different things. Jesus deals with demons here. He casts demons out, so that's what's happening. But what I said is this helps us understand what we can experience, sorry, what can be the experience of people with mental illness. Because all too often, mental illness is either literally or figuratively demonised. Think of how we use our language and how we have our sort of stereotypes in popular culture. People who struggle with addictions are often described as battling their demons. Lazy writing in horror movies slaps a mental illness on a villain to sort of explain their violence or twisted personality. All those run-of-action movies that featured a disturbed war veteran who suddenly snaps and runs amok. Those are all instances of people being dehumanised and demonised. They are other than us. They are less than us. They are worse than us. The man in Mark 5 has been treated so poorly by his community. Chained hand and foot. People trying to tame him or subdue him. Think of the chaining hand and feet sounds so much like the straight jackets and padded cells and institutions and chemicals and medications that have been used throughout history for people with mental illness. At the moment, 4.8 million Australians are dealing with mental and behavioural conditions. And I'm fairly confident that, that number's gone up uh, through COVID. Many of us struggle with trying to understand what elements of our thinking is an illness talking or that's the real me. 
medication can flatten our mood and we can wonder if our treatment is really being helpful to us or it's just making life easier for those who are caring for us. And we struggle with mental illness not being taken seriously by others. If someone's got a broken leg or a physical problem, uh, we, we are really uh, compassionate to people. We are not very compassionate towards people with mental illness. Back when we were looking at the weeping songs in the Psalms, we met people like David and Asaph and Heman and Naomi and Martin Luther and Vincent van Gogh, all people of faith who struggle with depression. And yet depression can be so easily dismissed by others. People are told, oh, stop being so down. Cheer up. You know, Paul says rejoice in the Lord always. So go on, you should be rejoicing. You know, we wouldn't be that flippant with a physical injury or illness. And anyways, if it's that easy to do, to suddenly uh, flick a switch and be happy again. Uh, one of the good things about working as a chaplain in the Air Force is that many people come and talk to the chaplains because it's a confidential uh, conversation. If they go to the psychologist uh, in the medical centre, that goes on your record and people uh, don't want to risk that going on their record and jeopardising their career. And so mental illness is sort of pushed to one side or, or kept down when other illnesses uh, are well treated. C.H. Spurgeon spoke about his experience. He's a, a Baptist preacher from the 19th century. Uh, he, he really struggled with depression and uh, he spoke about it in some of his sermons. He said, once my spirits were sunken so low that I could weep by the hour like a child and yet I knew not what I wept for. A kind friend was telling me of some poor old soul living near who was suffering very great pain and yet she was full of joy and rejoicing. I was so distressed hearing that story and felt so ashamed of myself. When people who struggle with depression just can't get out of that feeling and people come alongside and said, it should be easy, you're a Christian, you should be, it should be uh, just a matter of uh, trusting And as C.A. Spurgeon experienced, shame that we keep on seeing comes along to try and inflict further wounds. A fellow called Zach Eswine wrote a book about Spurgeon's experience with depression and he noted how Satan often tried to increase Spurgeon's suffering. He wrote, Satan doesn't originate or cause depression, but like a lion drawn to the weakened zebra in the herd, this evil creature derives peculiar pleasure from devouring those who are lame, sick or debilitated. We've seen that quite a few times already too with physical illness. That when we are down, when we are vulnerable, Satan loves to come in and uh, pile on those words of shame. Satan loves to find opportunities to increase our suffering. And in the realm of mental illness, Satan is not beyond recruiting Christians to help his aims. Catherine Webb is a Christian speech pathologist and she uh, struggles with uh, anxiety. And she talks about her experience like this. I'm often subjected to others expressing thoughts that directly assault how God made me while not knowing what they're doing. I was in a Bible study group with some very nice people and we ended up talking about anxiety. People began expressing at how all anxiety is sin and needs to be repented of. So I ask people to consider how there's a difference between everyday anxiety and chronic anxiety and was summarily dismissed. I was essentially told, it says in the Bible to not be anxious, so all anxiety is sinful and a constant state of sinning separates you from God, period. Even helpful scriptures can be twisted into weapons to further hurt those who are suffering. Sharon is a Christian who suffers from psychosis and that's where her brain misfires and she can hear voices or see things that aren't there. People from her church prayed for her one day and in that prayer they said, Lord, we pray that you'd break the stronghold of the devil in Sharon's life and that you would eradicate all influence of the demonic and deliver her. She said, it took me a long time to recover from that prayer. Did they think I was possessed? 
When she reads Mark 5, she says, I can't help remembering the times when, gripped by agitated depression, I've cried out and cut myself. But I know I wasn't possessed. Like many others, I find that my antipsychotic medications take away my symptoms or alleviate them greatly. You would not expect a drug to have the same effect on a demon. She knows only too well that mental illnesses are stigmatising. She reflects, as Christians, we have a role to play in eliminating this stigma and helping people with mental illness to integrate into the church and society. For this reason, we need to be very careful about diagnosing demon possession, which compounds that suffering even further. A survey in the United States in 2007 addressed the attitudes and beliefs of mentally ill Christians. Uh, sorry, I'll start it again. A survey in the United States assessed the attitudes and beliefs that mentally ill Christians encountered when they sought help from the church. Approximately 30% of them reported a negative interaction. They included being abandoned by their church or being told or equating their mental illness with the work of demons or suggesting that the mental disorder was the result of their personal sin. Analysis of the data by gender found that women were significantly more likely than men to have their mental illness dismissed by the church or to be told not to take their medicine. Now, the experience of the man here in Mark 5, although there's, there's parallels but there's distinct differences, has been matched by many throughout history, even today and even within the church. So is there hope? Well, what we've consistently found so far in this series is that when Jesus is present, there is always hope. There's always transformation. And if we were reading our way through Mark, when Jesus steps ashore here in Mark 5 and the man runs up to him, we've already read about Jesus' own experience. You could turn back a few chapters to Mark 3 and verses 20 to 22. It's just a short snippet of his life, but... It is a heartbreaking passage. It says, Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He's out of his mind. And the teachers of the law, who came down from Jerusalem, said, He is possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons he's driving out demons. Here, Jesus cops it from both sides. His own family says he's out of his mind. And so they come to take charge of him, you know, to subdue him, to control him, to tame him. And the leaders of the community say he's possessed. He's neither. But to be rejected like that must have hurt so much, especially by his own family. Watching what he's doing and concluding that he's mentally ill. And in, here in chapter 5 and verse 17, he's rejected again by the community on the other side of the lake where they ask him, they beg him to leave them. Or perhaps we could look ahead to Jesus' mental anguish and deep soul sorrow as he nears the cross. Jesus' words to his friends in the Garden of Gethsemane were, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And he asks them to stay with him and keep watch. Terrible heartache, terrible uh, uh, troubling of his mind. Jesus knows the depths that our hearts and our minds experience. Isaiah 53 is a refrain throughout our series as it speaks of Jesus, that he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. As he talks with the man here in Mark 5, Jesus has a deep experience and identification with the man. He's gone through similar things as that man. Isaiah goes on to say, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him stricken by God, punished by him, and afflicted. 
the pain that he is familiar with and took up for us is not only physical, but mental and emotional. He is with us in all our distresses. And so the suffering saviour meets this deeply suffering man and welcomes him into a new community and gives him a new purpose and restores his heart and mind. And so at the end of the passage, the man wants to go with Jesus. Well, and I don't blame him. He's been rejected by his family. He's been rejected by his community. He's been so poorly treated. And here's someone who not only has cared for him, but has freed him and restored him. Well, of course he'd want to go with Jesus. But Jesus doesn't let him. In verse 19, he says, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how much he's had mercy on you. Jesus says, go home. You know, the demons drove you away from home. Your family drove you away from home. Your community drove you away from home. But go back to them because now you are free. You're free to go and to tell the ones that you love and tell them what God has done for you. At one point you tried to destroy yourself, but now you have purpose in life. I'm going to leave, Jesus says, but you can stay and tell others about me. And in that lovely touch uh, where Jesus told him to go and tell all about what God has done for him, in verse 20 he tells everyone how much Jesus has done for him. And so that man who had been so confused, even to his own identity not so long ago, now has the clearest grasp of who Jesus is. Go and tell them how much God has done for you. Well, I'm telling you about what Jesus has done. He's been given a purpose to share with others, that community that once rejected him, the good news about Jesus. And then when we get to the end of the passage, we see Jesus getting back in the boat, and so we realise that Jesus came all that way just for him. He crossed the lake the night before, and now he's getting back in the boat, and he's the man that Jesus came for. We see the beautiful movement of Jesus in this passage, this intentional movement towards the man, coming all the way across the lake just for him, seeing a man made in God's image, a man to be restored and brought into the fold of the good shepherd. We get a glimpse of Jesus identifying with him in his own rejection by his family and community. And we see Jesus giving him a renewed purpose, participating in the kingdom. And that's been the way of Jesus ever since. You know, earlier I, I painted a grim picture of the way some people with mental illness have been treated by some churches and Christians. Approximately 30% reported a negative interaction. And so probably even then you were, you were thinking, hang on a second, Michael, but that means that 70% have had a positive interaction with churches. And the survey bore that out. One respondent said, I burst into the chapel one night, manic, hallucinating, and generally right out of my head. A kind and discerning priest, or who already knew about the bipolar, got me to the emergency room. At that point, he was the only one who could have done it. He definitely saved my life that night. My priest has always and will always be a source of great support and comfort. When someone I know will take me seriously, when things are at the worst they could be. It's a beautiful picture of the caring community. Other studies have found that an affirming religious support system can play a vital role not only in recovery from serious mental disorders, but also in their prevention. It's the work of Jesus continuing today through his people, taking mental illness seriously and treating people with mental illness with the respect gentleness and identification that Jesus does because at some point we all go through those kinds of struggles and we need each other to help us through that. A new community where we are all welcomed and people can find a new purpose in life where transformation and healing and grace are abundant. Well, why don't we pray about that? Let's pray.
Father, we thank you for your beautiful grace towards all of us. And we thank you for the Lord Jesus' uh, identification with us as human beings made in your image. Thank you for his compassion. Thank you for the reality that he is a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. We hate to see the way that he was treated by even his own family and his community. And yet we see here his beautiful compassion and empathy and identification with this man coming all that way just for him. Well, we thank you for the way that uh, he's done that for us at many times through our lives. And Lord, for those of us who are uh, battling mental illness or are caring for someone who is, Father, we often feel very isolated. Sometimes we feel ashamed because it's so poorly treated in our society. But we thank you that you know our hearts and you know our minds. And you know the hearts and minds of those who uh, can't even communicate clearly themselves any longer. Lord, we thank you for the way that you draw near to us and that you experience uh, our uh, distress and you come to bring grace and love and peace. And Father, we want to commit ourselves to you and those whom we love. And we long to be a community where, uh, where we are all cared for, where our thoughtfulness and our choice of language is uh, wise and compassionate. And that people might experience the same grace through the Lord Jesus today in us as this man did directly from Jesus all those years ago. And we commit ourselves in our church to you in that, in Jesus' name. Amen.